So let's let's talk about some ideas, but let's first talk in terms of maybe this isn't a good di- idea for everybody to consider even gradually easing into a multifamily office. So let's talk about three tough questions that a financial professional should ask themselves first to assess the opportunity. So number one, and I want your commentary on this too, are you prepared for a more demanding client with massive responsibilities? It is. It is such an important question. I love that we're addressing this first because before taking on any new initiative, it's always best to go in with your eyes open. And we don't want to encourage people one way or the other, just to give you the the all the information and then allow you make an an informed decision. You know, one of my my favorite uh, coaches on the Peloton, that's how he starts every workout. He says, over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to make suggestions and then you're going to make decisions. And that's what this is. We're going to make some suggestions and then you can make the decisions. One of those suggestions is go in it with your eyes open here. Be aware that this is exactly what you allow it to become. If if you want someone to be able to call you real life example again, because one of their pilots on their jet just took another position and that now position has to be filled, who's going to handle that? They don't want to handle it. Do you want them calling you on that? You do the vetting, identifying, interviewing, then bring them two or three qualified candidates. That's a real life example of what a family office has gone through that I've witnessed occur. Also, uh, it's not just those, those small things. It's, the, it's that artwork that's uh, at the fourth home that they're looking to get a loan on that has to be appraised internationally taking on on exchange rate risk, all these things, it can be pretty involved. Just be clear on the ground rules that you'd like to set going into it. It's almost like, are you the property manager of their third home? Do you want to be the person who's finding out like who's going to take care of the, the, you know, the damage that had occurred through the last hurricane on their, on their property? I, it is something to be aware of. It's a slippery slope on responsibilities and to-do list items if you become that that all go-to type type office. And it could be just the minutia of, oh, my fourth home in Miami, I forgot to pay the property taxes. And uh, now the city takes crypto. So, so can we work that out? I mean, yeah, so many moving parts that has to be process-driven through bench strength, impeccable best practices and a well thought out panoramic and all encompassing process. So yeah, that's number one. And then a perfect segue to the second question. Are you prepared to forfeit the safety net of a large diverse client base? Now what's interesting, the enlightened professional would say, Hey, my safety net, I've got 300 clients. It's been terrific. But it's a bit of a hammock now. I'm kind of in a mode of complacency and I'm trying to achieve that plateau avoidance. I want to find that next gear personally and professionally, right? The best version of myself. And to do that, I've got to play at that next level. So no disrespect to the 300, but my top 50 clients bring something out in me. But again, it's 50 clients. It's 25 clients. It's no longer 300. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's the idea of being over-concentrated versus being diversified versus being diluted, right? Where, where is, does dilution occur? Where is too concentrated, too concentrated? Uh, one, one advisor I know offhand is a billion plus assets with 23 relationships. And I was like, we're always talking about streamlining. And so I'm always talking about reducing the number of households and holdings create more capacity by reducing workload. We have those conversations all the time. But I can remember when I first met him, he had 17 clients and was running about 750 million at the time. And uh, I was like, wow, that's fantastic. I go 17, I've never seen anybody so focused. And this was back before MFOs were, were gaining popularity. This was probably 10 years ago. And, and he says, well, he goes, yeah, it's nice. Unless you lose one. <laughs> 
And that was when it got real. I'm like, yeah, I guess that could be bad. And so going into it with your eyes open again, there is a safety net there, but the more enlightened professionals, I believe, or uh, get past that one. It's just something I think that we have to acknowledge. Now, it's safe to say that that advisor you're speaking of, uh, 17 to 23, uh, professional scarcity is a big part of his value proposition when he meets with a prospective client? Well, no doubt. The, uh, there's so many scarcity stories o- over the years that you and I have both heard that it's just true. People of affluence, they, they want specialists not generalists. They want to know that they are, they are important to, to who they're working with. And, and those advisors, they leverage that. I I can remember a different event where we actually had an ultra high net worth individual come and speak to some advisors. Hmm. And one of the advisors asked, and there's maybe a group of 25 and it was at a, a racing, a car racing event. I can remember that was actually a fun event. And the, uh, one of the advisors said, I just have a question for you. What was a question that you asked advisors when you were interviewing them before the sale of your business on, on who you would go with? Did you ever ask a question and based on their answer, eliminate them immediately from uh, being a potential advisor for you? He says, oh, yeah. I, and I was curious what it was, too. He goes, we asked all of them how many clients they had. If the answer was over 35, it wasn't going to be a good fit everyone in the room. Now you got to keep in mind, these were really good advisors, but there wasn't one in the room that didn't have more than 35 clients should have seen some faces. And that's that kind of that reason for having this conversation. Now don't allow those people to feel they've outgrown you. A brand within the brand allows you to have that 35, maybe still maintaining the others as more of a, a, a figurehead to the team on the rest of the practice. So that, I'll, I won't forget the reaction of the advisors hearing that answer to that question. Well, I'm going to come back to that because there's an advisor in the Northeast that you and I know very well who uh, loves racing. And uh, he's found that sweet spot where he's got professional scarcity on one side and depth and breadth on the other side, just because he's so process driven. But I'll come back to that in a second, because there's a couple of things that I didn't, really fully understand until I started talking to top advisors in between our pre-call and this call today, which were incredible. And it's, it's framed around this third question. 